So anytime that you have a have a, a study that actually has a name, you know this one's serious. This this study is a, a a repeat of a previous study that was done in 1996 by Neil Jacobson. Um, this study done in 2006 was actually the last study Neil Jacobson did before he died. He died in his uh, late 50s, so it was a bit of a loss for for a psychologist. And you know we we proud we few behaviorists. But what what I'm only presenting today is this this study was really. Uh, a dramatic challenge against a lot of fundamental ideas of cognitive behavioral therapy and the usefulness of even attempting to channel or identify cognitive manifestations in clients that are suffering from depression. So if you notice like the authors on this research paper, these are the who's who in both the cognitive world and the behavioral world. You know, we have we have Dobson, we got Dunner, we have Holland. I mean, these guys, you can, you can bet your bottom dollar every single day this, story was, this, this study was going on, they were making nightly calls to Aaron Beck because they had a lot on the line. So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be describing, well, you know, number one, you know, get, getting a sense of, of what, what came out of this study, behavioral activation, which seems to be one of the best treatments for depression. So we'll be going through... Uh, the pieces of what behavioral activation entail, what you need to do. Um, and in general, I'll, I'll try and keep, a, keep an eye out for just, you know, cl more practical clinical uh, use of, of this approach as I, as I go through this actual research paper. I really regret I didn't send you guys the actual paper, so if you're, if you're totally interested, uh, type in, you know, Google Scholar, the title, Randomized Trial of Behavioral Activation, 2006, you'll get the paper. Okay, so the abstract. So this is the abstract of the study. So, so what, what, what they did here was they, like I said, they were having a replicated study from the one in, in 1996. And we're pitting against medication, the full cognitive behavioral therapy treatment, and behavioral activation. And, you know, there was really two main motivators for why they were investigating this. Well, number one, as far as medication goes, um, it is, you know, according to the APA, you know, the current standard as far as treating depression. Uh, but there's a lot of questions in terms of clinical use of medication. You know, number one, it might actually mostly be a placebo. There's a lot of really good research out there that's indicating that 80% of the effect of antidepressants is actually placebo. So if you're, say, using the Hamilton scale... I thought it was 60. Hmm? I thought it was 60. 80. So if you're using the Hamilton scale, you're probably getting an improvement of two points on that scale. That, that means it's not even clinically useful to give people medication outside the placebo. That isn't to say medication isn't useful, because placebo is very powerful. I mean, if we're going to be fair, most of therapy, the work that we do with people, can easily be argued to be under the category of the placebo effect. It's a social relationship with another person. So medication is quite effective. Um, and how to actually try and get the placebo effect without letting anybody know, you know, giving them a sugar pill. You know, we have ethical questions of whether or not we can actually sell sugar to people. So that's one problem with this thing. But a lot of times people don't like being on medication because, quite frankly, it's painful. There's a lot of side effects. And just getting on the medication, in best case scenario, you're, you're waiting out a month of... of, of turning your life upside down, and maybe the medication is going to balance out after that month. So while medication is the, is, is the advised uh, primary initial treatment for depression, a lot of problems with it. As far as CBT is concerned, which, you know, is the gold standard of therapy for depression, I mean, this was, depression was, was Beck's uh, golden boy, so to speak, when he wrote his first book coming out against the psychodynamic approach. Before CBT, we were seeing, with, with a psychodynamic treatment, something like 2% of, of clients actually recovering from depression using the psychodynamic approach at that time. Um, with Beck's approach, they were seeing dramatic improvements in terms of recovery. But despite that, there's a lot of different outcomes in the research showing, well, maybe it's not as effective as, as Beck was using it in his in his line of work. You know, if you ever see videos of, of Beck doing what he does, I mean, the man is beautiful. It's like watching poetry, watching this guy work. You'd never suspect the man who crafted one of the most systematized, orderly 
uh, 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 treatments is this poet in front of you. So there's, again, there's definitely this element of, of common factors of the therapeutic relationship that would probably go a fair way in describing why sometimes CBT is in research looks pretty good when it comes to depression and why other times it doesn't really look so good at all. Another, another part of, of why, you know, pushing this, re this particular research paper forward was this idea that Jacobson had stumbled upon himself in 96 when he was doing his original uh, uh, component analysis of CBT where it was coming out you really didn't need the cognitive aspects of CBT to get great results. So I want to get into that a little bit more. So, spoiler alert, what were the outcomes? It turned out that behavioral activation was way more effective that in treating severe depression than medication. It was way more effective in severe depression than cognitive behavior therapy. And it had a great job even though you might, might not get you know, most of your clients passing that threshold to no longer being clinically depressed, they, it had a, 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 a giant response rate. So you were, even though you weren't actually hitting your therapeutic goals, you were getting somewhere, which those, that was definitely lacking in the other two options with the medication and CBT. So the 96 study. What Jacobson was, was going into when he was doing the study, he wasn't expecting actually to find, you know, dramatic differences, you know, that, that uh, he wasn't expecting to find the cognitive part of CBT to not be important. You know, when he was pulling apart all the different aspects of CBT, he was expecting to find that basically what everyone else's assumption was, was that that would probably be the most important aspect of the treatment. So what he did, he was able to get 150 participants in his research program, and he had the same group of therapists treating everybody with only the behavioral aspects of CBT. So it's not a full behavioral approach. It's just things like behavior, uh, just things like you know activity schedules, um, mastery pleasure ratings, uh, graded task assignments, you know, just bare bones behavioralist stuff. And that would be group one. And the same therapists were then tacking on uh, targeting automatic thoughts. Now we're getting more cognitive. And then the third final group was the full form CBT. The results were shocking. There was literally no difference between group one, two, or three. They all had the same level of recovery and they had fair ratings across the board and it was great right that it was the same group of therapists because he was almost like within the research factoring in those common features of the therapeutic relationship the same personalities are doing the, the, the three renditions of the treatment so what he got out of this was the thought well, if behavioral activation, the behavioral aspects of things, had one hand tied behind his back, wouldn't it be interesting to see a full, pure behavioral approach to depression? What would that look like? And the second was that this 96 study was dramatically challenging the idea that you have to go deep when treating depression. And it might actually be a better idea to grab the low-hanging fruit. One of the first rules in CBT anyway, you know, the first several sessions when you're with a client, you're, you're, you're actually only targeting those low-level fruits because from a cognitive perspective, you're trying to uh, get rid of the cognitive distortion that therapy doesn't work. So you actually try and get a lot of really quick gains in the beginning of therapy, and then you move on to really trying to hit hard automatic thoughts and core beliefs. So well, what if you don't even have to do that? What if you just keep it simple? Go for the low hanging fruit. Okay. So the behavioral components of this, uh, as far as like I mentioned in this study, it was activity scheduling where basically, you, yeah, one before, yeah. So the three, the three behavioral techniques that were used in the 96 study, like I said, was just activity scheduling where, where basically what you're doing is you're moder monitoring the activity of a person over the week and putting into a grid and what you're doing is you're putting labels of well how much pleasure or how effective how much mastery does the person have when he does the things he's doing in his life 
and then we'll taking a look at his life in this sort of very bland, straightforward way, then raising the question, okay, well, whatever challenges you're facing in your life, let's break down those bigger, more complex problems and take baby steps and see if we can't clean up your activity schedule and make life easier for you. Mm -hmm. As far as the cognitive aspect in group two and three, this is a nice list of all the cognitive distortions that they were more or less trying to address. And I, I would say as far as giving a, you know, how you kind of like summarize a cognitive distortion, I think a useful way of thinking about them is an overly rigid map to life. And that even though this overly rigid map of life is low resolution, it has poor depth, it actually has tremendous scope in being easily applied to how you interpret everything in your life. So there's a, the, you know, I'm getting behavioral minded here looking at the function of these sorts of things, but the function I think in large part is having, you know, say black and white thinking reduces how complex you have to be when you look at, look at the world. In every sort of situation, black and white thinking can be a very good, bad way of understanding your life. It's a very good, bad way of understanding your life, meaning it's, it's effective. You can explain life with some level of satisfaction, but it lacks such depth. Not, I would say security. Not satisfaction, but, but a level of, I, I think black and white could thinking be. Give people, gives people security could because they don't want to be in Could be, could be, could be, could be. Could be. Of, right, it just it's, you know. Could be. Looking at the looking at the cognitive the cognitive model, what you're what you're ultimately trying to do throughout treatment is slowly identify. Uh, you know, you're 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 keeping a list of automatic thoughts as you're going through treatment, and using different inter re restructuring interventions, say like the Socratic method, or you know a really good one is the downward arrow intervention. What you're doing is you're really trying to get a clear picture of well, not just what these automatic thoughts ultimately are, but what are the schemas, the core beliefs that underlie every core thought. So you can use something like the downward arrow intervention, not just as a standalone sort of intervention when you're dealing with a nasty automatic thought, but you use it as a, as a, a diagnostic tool to figure out what are the schemas that are probably you know, lurking underneath. You say what that was basically downward arrow? Well, basically what you're doing is, you know, someone has a problem, you know, they're worried to go out in public. Okay, well, why are you worried out to go out in public? Well, maybe some will see me. Oh, okay, that's interesting. You know, who do you think will see you? And what you, you gain greater, great, basically what you're doing is you're taking this low resolution cognitive distortion, giving it depth, giving it detail to the point where you're, you're really arriving at something you can start challenging effectively. I find people terrifying. That would be maybe a, a common schema a person would have. And you can, once you kind of arrive at that, that, core, that core belief, you can start challenging it in different ways in different contexts. So that's how you would use it as a diagnostic tool. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, one, one I love is, you know, as far as, as far as the cognitive stuff goes, is the, the emotional role play where you, the therapist, would take the role of the nasty thoughts, the, the core belief, and argue with the client. And then you switch, switch roles and have the client take on the core belief and argue. And it, it, there again, this sort of cognitive restructuring is flushing out how this is such a low resolution way of looking at life. It just doesn't really work so well. And man, if you just add some detail, the problem shrinks, becomes something you can solve, and maybe you don't even have to solve it. Maybe it's so small with all the detail that you add, it can actually just hang out and be there. It's not such an issue. So that was the 96 paper. Those were the different interventions being used. And with this 2006 paper, the gloves are coming off. We're untying the other hand of the behavioralist to see. This our, is 2010. This, is to, this book is 2010. This is an outline of behavioral activation. So if you guys want to read a good book on behavioral activation, this is the book you want to get. Uh, these. The, these authors were a part of, of the study I'm presenting. And a lot of what they came out with in their 2010 book is exactly coming from that research that we're covering today. So there are 10 core principles to behavioral activation. The first is the idea that the key to change has nothing to do necessarily with trying to target how people think or feel, 
If you want to change those things, if you want to improve someone's mood, all you have to do is just change what they do. That's principle number one. That's complete behavior. That's just complete 100% behavioral. Nothing else. Uh, the theory of how depression comes about with this approach is, you know, obviously, you know, life's tough, you know, life knocks people around, and, and you know, it's normal for people to feel depressed when things don't go their way. But what ends up happening with depression, as opposed to being really upset because something bad happened, is when you are, say, from an emotional, uh, emotional theory, you know, sadness has a function of making a person stop, to take stock of their world. That's the function of sad. That's why you don't want to do so much stuff. That's why you stop dead in your tracks. You Something's not working in life, so it's probably a bad idea to keep pushing forward. It's a good idea to stop and take an accounting of what's going on. But what that might actually do is start disconnecting a person from how life in other different aspects of life feels really good. And the depression builds, and it becomes this, this positive feedback loop to the point where you ain't getting out of bed. The third principle to behavioral activation is that what you're really trying to do is you're trying to find what are these, what are these, uh, what are, what are the d depressing behaviors that is in the person's life, and what you're wanting to do is replace them with antidepressant behaviors. So what you're doing a lot of is you're tracking antecedents and consequences that are surrounding the behavior of depression and trying to clean those up. Uh, you're going to be creating a structure and a, you know, scheduled activities in the person's day. And the basic idea with this, this fourth principle is that the action has to follow first. You don't wait to be in the mood to do something. So there's a, a, a nice little thing I like to do with clients. You know, I, I have the benefit of having a sink in that room and, and I love it because I get to do this, this intervention with people. You know, I, someone's coming in to kind of describe this idea that don't wait to feel like you want to do something. I have my dirty cup of coffee sitting next to me. I say, okay, you know, pull, open the, pull open the screen, we got the sink there. And I ask, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how much do you want to clean my cup of coffee? Now I, they're saying ones, zeros, negative fives. No one wants to clean my cup of coffee, so, so fine. So we just, we're just standing there and I asked the person, okay, well, you know what, what's, what's that over there? Oh, yeah, that's the sponge. Okay, and well, where's the soap? And they, they find the soap, and you know, what does the soap smell like? Oh, they smell this, oh, it's apple, that's great. And, okay, go, go ahead and pick up my cup, and they pick up the cup, and I go ahead and pick up the sponge, and they pick up the sponge, and then I say, okay, go ahead and sit down. And they all look at me like I'm, like I'm daft, like I'm ready to clean it. And when I ask them on a scale of 1 to 10, you know, how much do you want to clean my cup of coffee, it's usually 7s, 6s, 10s. The mood doesn't come first. What, what you have to do, and this is kind of, you know, point 0.5 here, that change is easier when you're starting small, is you're building a chain of behaviors that are approaching ever so slightly to your target. And that's the only way change is going to come, that's the only, the only way you're going to be in the mood to do something is you have to act first. Number six is you, you're, you're, you're looking for, as you're restructuring a person's life and you're finding antidepressant behaviors, you're looking for things that are naturally rewarding. Um, this one can be pretty tough because, like I said, the person really doesn't want to do much of anything. So you're not, in, in, in as far as gauging your success going through behavioral activation, you're not waiting to hear how great things are. You want to hear, oh, that felt weird. You want to hear, oh, that felt kind of awkward. That's fine. Just as long as the person doesn't say they were suffering while they were doing it. And gradually as you go through the, the actual, the entire therapeutic process, those, hey, that's awkward, hey, that was kind of weird, that was okay. Oh, I'm kind of enjoying that now. Hey, that feels great is going to develop. Can I share? Yeah. I have a yeah. Who's depressed, can't get out of her behavior, keeps wanting to change her life. And so I, she started to talk, and I listened to her. And she said, then I have to go new, get new clothes. I'm like, good, I want you to go to the store, get an outfit. Yeah. She's like, what? Well, that'd be expensive. I said, no, no, you can find something on sale today. Clothes aren't as expensive, but can you imagine? Yeah. What would be like just to go in the street? goes, well, you know, I'm a little heavy. I said, yeah, but they have nice clothes for women of all sizes. You can yeah. go in, find yourself. And, and what will it look like? And what color would you like to get? Mm -hmm. And I just want to get this. I just want you to hang it in your closet and look at it. And this is my going to work outfit. She wants okay. To 
So yeah. that's all she's doing. Yeah. Because if I just told her to get a job, when nothing Yeah, happened. nothing's happening. Um, and the reason, I, and then I said, if you want, you can pay me. I'll even tell with you I've done that. I have actually done that. Yeah. Um, we'll go to the store and pick out something that you feel good about. Shopping some day. women, they cannot, they need that. Will you do that with me? <laughs> you have to pay me. <laughs> so, um, and it was just this idea of you can't get to her. She keeps wanting, everyone tells her to get. I'm like, okay, well, what do we yeah. need to do first? Yeah. Well, if you had an outfit, you might feel a little bit more confident. So what's that gonna? And that's very important. And what about? And she says, "Well, I need shoes." I said, well, it's, you know, fine here. Everything can be on sale. You know, every how about you know, just go and just let's just imagine." I'm just getting all happy about this. But that's it. Yeah. What's cool about your example is it went from being an artificial reinforcer to a natural one when you linked it to work. Yes, exactly. Because, and now sometimes you want to have an artificial reinforcer. So, you know, I had a client who the guy wasn't showing up to yeshiva, again, dealing with self-esteem issues. There was a bit of depression, a bit of anxiety. And so he was irritating his Rebbe something fierce to the point where he was being threatened. Man, if you don't show up to class, we're kicking you out of yeshiva. So... Although you want to strive to find natural reinforces that naturally exist in a normal person's life, well, sometimes you have to, you know, do a kickstart like, you know, buy the buy an outfit, you know, that'll feel good. Mm -hmm. Here, I, I said, you know, every if you were able for a week straight to, uh, I had to make a, a chart, and we were putting stickers every day when he would show up on time, and we built, you know, up behaviors where what he would have to do in order to show up on time. And I said, man, if you're able to bring in your chart with all your stickers, I'm giving you a Snickers bar. The guy did not get kicked out of yeshiva. It's not it's the best it. intervention because it's not a natural reinforcer. But at the very least, I was fending off falling into a deeper depression because now he's disconnected from his friends and something that gives his life meaning. Mm -hmm. number, number seven, act as a coach. You know, person's coming in, yeah. you're just pushing them forward, you're giving them encouragement, <coughs> trying to be the fuel to yeah, let's I'm do something fast. next, do something else, do something else. Yeah which is really eight and nine of emphasizing problem solving. We're, 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 we're testing out, well, let's just see what it feels like to put on that dress. Mm -hmm. Let's just see what it feels like to put on those shoes. And like I said, the bare minimum is if they don't feel like it's suffering god awful, you've hit your target. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line. And you're, like I said, just doing it, you know, number nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go for it, what's up? So psychodrama, um what I like about it is that we try really hard not to sit in the chair for more than like, <laughs> right. And like we're doing life, we're doing, like, yeah. I call it rehearsals for life. Like, okay, yeah, what nice. does it look like in your kitchen? Let's do your kitchen. Let's, re you can't handle your kitchen. Okay, let's, let's, let's re redo this scene. Add something else. Add breathing. Add this. And then we redo the scene. Yeah. With some, some new element mm -hmm. in it. Um, and I'm not as good as walking outside as you, but at least we don't sit in a chair, which is why I like a big room. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that idea of getting out of there, it's the, also the act idea, get out of your mind, mm -hmm. into your life. Like, yep. you are not getting stuck in your thoughts, which narrow your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a very, um, and it's very, very helpful, because how much is talking going to help them? They just... Right, talk. right. It right. just kind of like they'll just get in. I, I told you, you just get in deeper into your depression. You just fed, like doesn't work mm -hmm. until we can get you to do something. Think of it. So I'll tell people you have five minutes to fetch, and then we're doing something. Then we're doing something. Yeah, yeah. right. Because they need a place to fetch. Right, one hundred percent. One hundred percent. They don't always have another place. One hundred percent. But not for sixty minutes. One hundred percent. After a while, you know, you hear that it just is helpful yeah. to them. So, so if what if like the thought, like the negative thoughts, like that are keeping them. Yeah. Are intrusive, like well, the intrusive yeah. We're going to get to that because right. behavioral activation has does right. have right. has specific right. interventions for rumination, rumination. which rumination right. is just basically right. avoidance also. Uh -huh. well, so, so we're going to yeah we'll go, we're going to hold that one we're going to hold that one and then the la the last the last core principle is you know troubleshooting which right. your which your goal is is not just in the moment troubleshooting what might happen or what, what might get in the way of the homework or whatever exercise you guys agree on. But you're, this in of itself is its own intervention. You want to train someone to do, be really good at troubleshooting mm -hmm. because you know, we don't want them to be hanging out you know, for, for who knows how long with, in therapy. They need to be their own therapist. And it's the troubleshooting aspect here that they need to take home uh, and, and really get a sense, okay, I can, I can do this one. Yeah. And it's simplistic enough they can do it. That's, that's also another idea here with with any time you're, you're not just with behavioral activation, but any treatment you're doing, you know, kind of having an idea 
in the back of your mind of, okay, fine, whatever I'm doing, try and simplify it as much as possible because I want this person to repeat everything we're doing here in the rest of their life so I don't have to see them again. It's true. Okay. So I just want to cover briefly, um, you know, what the difference is between, between consequences and antecedents and what, you're really, what, what these things really involve. So when it, when it comes to a consequence, you know, a behavior, when you look at a behavior, it really has three parts. It's, you know, what comes before the behavior, the behavior itself, and the consequence. So an operant is really a behavior that's controlled by a consequence. It, it has a function. So kind of what you're talking about, you know, looking at, looking at you know, uh, safety seeking. Well, that's an operant. Its function, whatever that behavior is, its function is being safe. Or maybe it's getting attention. Or maybe that's how you get assistance. Maybe that's how you get approval from other people. I had a client who he came in and his, 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 a lot of different issues going on, but one big one was he was randomly throwing up in public. Oh, wow. Just randomly. It was specifically in places, as I, was do, as I was going through a functional analysis, it came out, it was in places where he got a lot of approval and a lot of support from people. A lot of like, and it was a, a lot of symptoms. It was interesting because what 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 what, I, what caught my eye about this was he kept going back to those places. He didn't have a phobia of let's say going to shul is a good example. He didn't have a phobia of going to shul. He didn't have a phobia of being in the shots. But man, every time he did it, off to the bathroom or right there on the floor. So. <coughs> looking looking at that behavior functionally, well, okay, it's it's getting. It's getting support, it's getting praise. Let's get rid of that as soon as possible. So we agreed, okay, what we're gonna do is, you know, go into shul tomorrow and talk to everybody in shul and just let them know, okay guys, you know, I'm trying something weird here. If I, if I throw up, I don't want anyone to say a word. You just leave me to my own devices. He stopped throwing up within a couple days. What did he use to get that attention? He needed a... He threw up. No, but, what, but now he's not throwing up. So now yeah, what's he going to do? Yeah, where's he going to get his love support? What's he going to do to get that same attention? It wasn't lacking in other areas. You know, he had a, he had a, he had a. What did he Went away and he felt great. And that was just well, it. that's well, it. Again, I didn't, think what everybody's didn't asking Didn't care. Because it wasn't a problem. No, but he still got the chance to be shot. He, and I, I wonder also, you know, when, when people finish, they get the shkoyach, you know, like he got the chance to get that shkoyach he never got, you know, because he, he didn't have a chance to finish davening, you know, so that was great. But that was what you used mm. to fill that. That was it. Because he needed something. That was it. Did we raise it? No, I, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of like going on Lena's uh, um, uh, direction is, is that obviously there was something that that was filling in, so when he stopped, Meaning he was getting something out of it. So the question is, what did he replace? Those are two very different statements. Filling in or getting something out of. It might not be that it's, it's filling anything. He might just be getting something out of it. That's a very different well, way of saying, looking at a right, problem. Right, he's yeah, getting yeah. something out of it. But yeah. the, quest, the question is, once he stops, what does he, he, what does he fill in with? Right, I mean, meaning it, might, it might not be that there's any, any necessity to think about that. That, that's, what, that's what I'm arguing from a behavioral standpoint. Is it, it, that we, could, and I'm saying in theory, it could be, you know, if that was a problem, well, maybe that was resolved and I never had to discover it because he was getting the shkoyach when he finished davening. It could be. Um, but I, but it, I wouldn't necessarily assume you have to fill in anything. It just could be the cycle got out of control. And maybe there was one moment he, he, he had, he had uh, food poisoning, went to shul, threw up, had a great experience, ever being, everybody being very supportive, and maybe that was in connection with the touch of anxiety he had already, that it had a physiological effect and the thing just went on a, on a, on a like I said, a positive feedback loop. Could be, could be. So, so, so the operant has a function, and it's, it's getting something, and it's, it's either, either the, the, the function is going to be some sort of reinforcer, <laughs> positive or negative, you know, positive reinforcer, getting a lot of attention. You know, a negative reinforcer is, you know, classic example of that is the phone. The darn thing won't stop ringing, and then you answer it. It stops annoying you. That's a positive, that's, a, that's negative reinforcement. Or there's a punisher that, that will decree, that you're looking at the consequence, and that's a punisher or extinction is how you decrease specific behaviors. The other side of this, the antecedent, well, that's really responding conditioning. That's classical Pavlovian sort of, sort of stuff. That's what an antecedent basically is. Uh, 
a lot of people kind of look at this as like, oh, it's a reflex, and not quite. You know, I think that uh, Rescorlo had a really great way of summing up what, uh, what, what respondent conditioning is, that it's, it's, it's not a stupid process by which the organism willy-nilly forms associations between any two stimuli that happen to co-occur. It involves the learning of relations amongst events, so as to allow the organism to represent its environment. What antecedents, what, what, res, what, what classical conditioning really is, is the creation, or the, really more the revealing to the organism, of the value it sees in its environment. It's very meaning value based, respondent conditioning. So in order to change an antecedent, well, what you're trying to do is you're trying to break this association. You're trying to cease making that antecedent have the value and meaning it has. So in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a situation of depression, well, feeling sad, you want to cut that guy off from not doing anything. Okay. And, and as far as like the, the way these two things kind of go together, <coughs> Uh, looking at Watson and Tharp, and I love that this is a really good way of summarizing operant conditioning as relationship to respondent conditioning. And that's through operant behaviors that we act, we function, and produce effects on ourselves and on our environment. And that through the effects, through those consequences, the environment acts once again on us, becoming an antecedent. So in as far as what you define as a consequence or what you define as an antecedent <coughs> is fairly subjective because it really is a loop of continual motion, continual movement, action unfolding. As far as the, the stance, the overall philosophy of this model is we are trying to maintain as a, as a strong infinite emphasis the, ses the session structure action-oriented, you're, you're validating constantly, but you're doing so strategically, where either you're trying to regulate the mood of your client, you want to try and bring down their emotional dysregulation so you can do planning work with them in their life. It's not to make them feel good, although that might be nice, but it's in order so that you can actually do work with the client. Or number two, you're using validation as, as positive reinforcement. You're trying to increase specific behaviors you want in session. Either you see some sort of adaptive behavior, it's bam, you jump on that one. Or the person sharing information, you know, it's going to probably be very painful information, they won't want to share it. So you have to validate and, and positively reinforce that sharing so they do more of it, so you have more data as a clinician to solve the problems that are affecting this person's life. And also you're kind of looking, you're looking out for, uh, you know, anti-avoidance in, gen in general, which is kind of, you know, similar to the, to the other point I mentioned about just sharing the problems they're having. So that's validation. You know, working collaboratively with, with the client, you guys are two people together. It, it's, there's less of an emphasis on, there's less of an emphasis on you being the expert, although you, you are, and that's recognized, but you're really trying to tone down that one, and it's, it's this sort of, curious, open sort of, hey, let's just see what happens if we do this sort of sort of relationship, as opposed to instructing and being more uh, uh, you know, uh, um, um, dictatorial about it, I guess, is one way of thinking about it. And so you're, you're being non-judgmental, expressing warmth, you know, having genuine regard for the client, and, and you're, again, you're trying to reinforce all these reports of when they're doing well, when they're being, being adaptive in their life. And as far as the specific acts that you're, that you're doing as the therapist, you're really cycling through eight, where you're, again, you're constantly trying to assess the factors that are contributing to the depression, and you're trying to counter the avoidance. That's what the big emphasis in behavioral activation is. You're framing everything as just an avoidance behavior. You That's, what do you tell the clients? Uh, basically this. You tell them they're just doing that to avoid it? Uh, give, give a basic explanation of behavioral... Uh, behavioral uh, um, jargon, more or less. To avoid it, why? So we work that out with the functional analysis. You usually never have to actually answer that question because you're starting with the functional analysis, and it's like, oh, okay, that's interesting. So, oh, you yell when you talk to your parents. Okay, fine, that's interesting. Oh, when you go to work, you yell at your boss. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, so you just notice, oh, it's the same problem manifesting over and over and over, and. You kind of beg the question, well, you know, how's that working out for you? Not really well. And that's when you kind of jump into making the distinction between good short-term uh, solutions and bad short-term solutions and how maybe you want to try and 
and, and what we'll work together building is better long-term solutions. That's re it really, that's, that's the basic bolts of how you kind of describe that, and it that seems to work. This is used for depression. Yeah, you use this in any other context, not just depression. I mean, this, this is a good formula for anxiety. It's a good formula for, uh, as far as my work in, in personality disorders with borderline personality disorder, works just fine. It, it, in fact, oftentimes the less complicated the better, and this, that's the beauty of this approach is that it's just so simplistic. You don't really need so much explanation of how this stuff works to get the person on board. Okay. Well, I would imagine it depends on the individual. Mm -hmm. Like, some yep. people are more curious. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if people want to understand where this comes from. Yeah. <coughs> And so again, so again, the 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 the, the again, you're always cycling through trying to be as specific as possible. You're monitoring every behavior, trying to get to the nuts and bolts of exactly what was happening, when, where, and how. Constantly validating and just assigning activities, troubleshooting, and encouraging. That's that's the whole session is going to be these eight over and over and over. Okay. So the the treatment the treatment stage is unfold. You know, I kind of already got into this, I guess. Is you're starting with a functional analysis. You're, you're linking all your A's, B's, and C's, your antecedents, behaviors, and consequences together to get a picture of what's going on in the person's life. Oh. Well, that's avoidance, yeah. That, 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 that is avoidance. That's so funny. You're saying patient. You're yeah, very painful, yeah. Yeah. Relaxing. To put your head in the ice. Oh, it's tomorrow. I know. It's good, right? Yeah. Ice fishing. Ice fishing, right. Ice fishing. You know, I have a really fun mental picture of that right now. <laughs> hiding from hiding from his hiding from his problems. So you're 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 basically through the functional analysis, figuring out what's causing what behaviors are causing the depression, and you're you're setting up an activity schedule to replace those things. You know, you're monitoring the behavior, you're doing the problem solving. And that's, that's really the, the, the activity schedule is the core of the work you're doing. You know, you're making sure the guy's bringing in a sheet every week, and that might be a problem, so you're going to have to try and use some, some, some tactics to make sure and encourage and increase that behavior of bringing in the sheet every week. But, like, that's, it's, that, that sheet is the, is the nuts and bolts of this thing. And ultimately what you're doing is, is like I said, the... the, the Behavioral activation is more or less looking for and defining maladaptive behavior as always being avoidant. So there's never really a big surprise what the problem's suffering from. You're just basically calling it avoidance and, and, just, and fishing out how this is avoidant and replacing that behavior. Can I just ask, like, yeah. if that behavior involves, like, going to the shops, and, yeah, the, in the shops is where you have your triggers, mm. because you know, the, the culture in Israel... Yeah. Where it puts you back into your depressive, like people can't, there's no customer service, they don't care, no one cares, like they're rude, like yep. it's great. So, but, you're, but you want them to go out of the house, mm -hmm. but then they get a really right, yeah. reinforcement. Yeah, saying, yeah. They, they get what they want to buy. Pardon? They get what they want to buy. Um, yeah, that's what they get. Well, the... not if it falls apart and then they don't get the customers, you know. Yeah, right, yeah. I mean, the, the, the way you... That's right. depending on somebody else doing something for you. What, what that would basically look like is you're using the activity schedule exactly sorry. In, in such a way where you're breaking down the behavior of going to the shop into small parts, and it would, it would look very much like exposure right. therapy, graduated exposure right. therapy. That's really what it is. To, to the painfulness of going to the store. And seeing that you can survive it, and 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 you're wanting to, as as far as like the behavioral aspects concerned, you know, putting in, you know, value of what this will mean for you as this is changing your life. And good job, you were able to you were able to take those ten steps towards the store, and now you did twenty. Now you're in the store. Well, that was, uh, I mean, it's patronizing for someone that knows how to shop. They just I don't like just people that that are, like, don't take responsibility yeah. for an item. There's a there's a there's an interpersonal finesse you have to do, but that's basically the structure. Exposure therapy. Okay. 
And then, and then, so we're we're really as far as our primary target, we're looking towards trying to reduce avoidance, and we're also trying to the way the way the behavior activation looks at rumination is is a, is a lot different than cognitive therapy, and we're going to get into that. But you're targeting you're targeting rumination, <coughs> that you're highlighting the consequences of the rumination. That's you're highlighting the consequences of rumination. Well, what does rumination get you? A whole lot of pain. And you're trying to figure out different activities to replace rumination with. You know, maybe one one way to problem solve this one is set aside 10 minutes of rumination and leave it at that. You might be able to get away with that. You're using mindfulness skills to try and... I was saying earlier, you know, uh, rumination is, is in of itself an avoidance tactic. Where what you end up doing, you kind of imagine like a, you know, a, an upside down cone. The like rumination is the point of the cone, and up here is all the detail and all, all the real meat of what's going on in that moment. And what you're trying to do with rumination is you're trying to get the person to move from that low resolution, you know, my mom's coming to visit, my mom's coming to visit, my mom's coming to visit, to increasing more detail. And, and the broader of a description you have that moment, it's almost like, well, you, you, you're experiencing more, you're seeing more, and, and solutions almost feel like they present themselves to you as opposed to having to come up with them. But it's the more contact you're willing to have with that thought, the more possibilities are going to manifest themselves. So, and maybe you might also have to use a little bit of distraction or, you know, some, some other sort of things to get by. You know, I wouldn't exactly encourage overly using distraction because you get the boomerang effect on that one but if it's a question between something really bad happening and okay well maybe we're running a risk of of this being a crutch maybe it's a good temporary crutch to use distraction so um any information on this for kids because i have a couple of ruminating kids yep works great with kids (laughs) in fact it's easier with kids because kids are generally more curious and, and, and there's more... And I mean, they'll follow your Yeah, and there's, it, it, mm. there's a lot more flexibility in the way that they... they and a lot more authority they're giving you also. So it's like with oh, kids... Not necessarily more than adults. More than adults, that's for sure. So it's, it's, you, have, you have those two pluses on your side. So generally kids go along with this a lot more easily than adults. Although this is okay, pretty straightforward for adults, also. Stuck on yeah, sure. Let's yeah, in fact, their, their entire yeah their entire school systems that use mindfulness mm-hmm. start their day. They have like twenty minute mindfulness in the morning, and that's the way that they solve their inner city crime problem in their yeah. school. And they're using it no, from kindergarten, using it from kindergarten up to high school. So, what are the differences between between behavioral activation and cognitive therapy? So like I said, you know, the main target for behavioral activation is avoidance. You're trying to increase the opportunity for natural motivation. You know, you don't want to just keep giving this person dresses in a candy bar, but it has to be rooted in their natural environment. And the, the, while both approaches have experimentation as a part of the treatment, they're looking at experimentation very differently because, well, for, for a behavioralist, hey, let's try this experiment to see what the consequence is. There's no tricks involved. Does this feel good? Great, it feels, it feels good, do it again. Whereas for, for, from a cognitive standpoint, experiments are not so much to get the person to do something, but it's to prove, hey, see what happens when you challenge that cognitive distortion. It's more cognitively based. And again, with, when, when approaching rumination, it, from a behavioral approach, you're looking at thoughts as useful or not useful, not true or not true, truthful or not, not truthful. That's more of a cognitive way of looking at thoughts. And your focus is on, well, what's the functional process? What do these thoughts get you? Because they're getting you something. And again, like the, 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 the process is very... very true for OC, OCD comes without... That with the person really not feeling they have any control over it. The brain is very, it's different. The sense. This, this this theory, the way of, of defining rumination, even for OCD, works. Um, you can frame it that way, and it's really cool. <laughs> I'm just, you can do it. It, it again. When it, comparing these sort of approaches is not to say one is correct and one's not, 
because you definitely can treat OCD not this way. You'll find exposure therapy really good for OCD. Yes, yes, you do. A, a, part of, a part of that can either because you're challenging the thought or you're seeing the thought's not useful. Well, like the structure of what you're yeah. doing is up for debate. You might end up from, a, you know, I mean, like I said, you know, both the cognitive approach and the behavioral approach are both using experimentation. Mm -hmm. But there's very different reasons why you're using it. And so it'll, it'll come up in treatment differently, but m maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe all you just need to do is like the point is the experiment and not so much why you're doing it. So I'm not... I'm not trying to, even, even though there were great results with behavioral activation for depression, I'm not trying to say one is a better, more truthful treatment than the other. I, I think that, that it's really yeah. it's a combination of both. I mean, it, you know, I, I find like every, every, some clients react better to, to some, some therapies and other clients react better to other ones. And, right. and sometimes it's a combination of really doing some cognitive, some behavioral, and, and you know, whatever speaks out to them. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think what happens is yep. you get, you know, if you, the only thing you have in your toolbox is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So right. you got you to gotta kind of like work around and see some, some clients, because of their background, let's say, from family of origin, need a little more coaching, need yep. a little more behavioral stuff. You know, if their family system is good, then they may need a little bit more cognitive stuff because yep. it's what, you know, what yeah. both. So. I mean, the, really, the clinical outcome of this is, well, we're kind of seeing... You know, gave the spoiler alert that behavioral activation does have more success. So it's like that might be true, but don't start there. It it might be clinically more useful to always start with the position of I don't have to deal with thoughts, I don't have to deal with core beliefs. Maybe if I just get the person to act differently, this one's going to go away. And it's highly likely that's true. And there is a trade-off that it might actually be you know until you until you have some indication maybe more of a cognitive approach would be useful. It might actually it might actually hinder treatment. So it's not it's never immediately obvious which way to go to begin with. But if you're if you're playing safe, what 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 this what this research paper and, and all the work that's come out of behavioral activation would indicate is it's probably the best place to start all things considered for depression. For depression. Agreed. For depression. Because I, I think that a lot of depression yeah. goes around thinking patterns yeah. and sort of break the thinking pattern. You know that. To try and break thinking patterns with other thinking patterns, it's kind of like trying to get yourself out of a problem using the same logic. It's very cognitive of you. Right. So, yeah. so just, you know, the fact is getting people up and moving, but sometimes right. it's a really hard thing when a person can't get up and moving. Yeah. If there's no chemical around. Right. No, I mean, you, you know. Do you know that chemical imbalances are really up in the research in terms of whether they really exist? Right, that's, that was, that was the, the 80% placebo effect. It's a question of how much it really exists. They actually haven't been able to prove it as, as yes. depression. And, and, and even more so, like, you know, it's, it's a, a, get, getting cognitive, like, what you can, like, end up getting snagged on is the question, answering the question why. You know, within a behavioral activation approach, you're not asking why ever. You, you're staying away from why like the plague. Because, well, when you ask why, what ends up happening is you might actually be stumbling on the, the client giving you a socially understandable, acceptable rationale for the behavior, having nothing to do with why they're actually doing it, just so they don't look stupid. And it reinforces and it ingrains more, more vigorously the behaviors that are causing the problems. Now, what I thought was really interesting, I was thinking about this because if you look at the research on, on bibliotherapy, amazing. Bibliotherapy is, is, is an awesome approach of getting people to write out their problems, but why doesn't hack it when it comes to bibliotherapy? What you're shooting for when you're doing that sort of work is you're wanting to, to encourage the client to have, you know, in his writing where he's describing what he understood, what was revealed to him, what he realized, what he saw, but not why. Those are very different mm -hmm. descriptions of their life. And so it very it reminded me very much of 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 the way the way Freud defined catharsis as being the linking between thought and feeling. You know, a lot of people kind of think of it as catharsis as getting getting out an action. It's like totally not what he was talking about. But it's really linking feelings and thoughts together and giving them more of a, a, a more of a, a a phenomenological lived experience so that they can be something you hold. Very much like that, but whys? Why is the worst? Even in bibliotherapy. I think oh. another um, thought is that yeah. something like internal family systems, mm -hmm. 
when you do identify it besides behavior and cognitions, emotions, yeah. and you bring a connection there and a validation of it and respecting of it, that seems like a, an approach I didn't hear from you that could be also very healing and very healthy as to we wouldn't avoid at all costs the why. We would allow the right, person right, to be Right, very different that way. We would yeah, that's, that you're right, you, right. That would be a difference. That would be a huge difference, right. Yeah, behavioral activation is banking on the assumption why is it dangerous. Whereas other therapies not. Other therapies wouldn't. But I, I thought biblioth bibliotherapy was a good example because that's like that, that one in the extreme is trying to find more explanatory aspects to a person's life, but what's missing even there is the why. Again, it's more of the realization, the noticing, the, 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 the understandingness, which, which is different than why. That's kind of what I wanted to suggest, you know, as, as, uh, well, as totally one way of splicing depends, that one. Though, bibliotherapy totally depends on where the person is going with it. Some people will write the story of the why of the kid went through ABC or the father or the mother but other people will write and is not as effective that's what uh, uh, yeah is, and is not effective <coughs> that that actually makes a difference if uh, the the depends what the kid wants to write uh, yes but <laughs> if you're if you're a betting man you're hoping he doesn't write that no it might work out but if you're a betting man you don't want the person to write wise because they actually don't work as well It could, it could, but again, like it's it's. What's the long term outcome of this behavioral activation and CBT versus the more the more deeper um, concepts where, we, where we're digging in the lies? Like I I, I hear you hundred percent. Yeah. Within the first year after whatever it is, it will be better if you just help them mm -hmm. think about it differently, mm -hmm. help them do yep. different at that moment. My question is: five years down the line, ten years down, are they back in the chair? Nope. Dobson, Dobson, after the study, did a long-term a long-term follow-up of after two years, and the the outcomes were solid. The outcomes were solid. Two years after, yeah, two years after treatment, these folks were solid. So it, 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 we're kind of dancing around this this idea that you know like that that they are very different. These two ways of approaching a client, you know, whether it's with wise or whether it's more behavioral. We're looking at two very different things. Behavioral activation is functional. We're looking for trying to examine behaviors only through that lens. Whereas the cognitive model is structural. It, it, it is trying to figure out, well, what are the, the, the different parts? What's the topography of the client's life and what's in front of the person? So another way of kind of looking at it is you have the same dichotomy in biology in looking at how organs function or what organs are made out of. Now both are important and you will see gains in either. That's 100% true. Like I said, you know, the cognitive, cognitive behavior therapy is, is also effective. You don't get nothing out of it. And so it is two different ways of looking at a problem, fundamentally. And just in more graph form, you know, these graphs are kind of representing, I thought this one was really good as far as CBT is concerned, looking at how the events trigger the schemas, and that, that shoots right up into the relationships between behaviors, emotions, and thoughts. Looking at things this way, in this sort of structural way, what you're looking at is how the same schemas popping up in the different problems in a person's life, and ultimately uh, you're, you are addressing those, those issues, and it doesn't really matter where you start. You can start with thoughts, you can start with emotions, you can start with behaviors, and as long as you're working your way back to the schemas, you're good to go. It's a structural approach to therapy. Whereas with behavioral activation over here, well, what you're trying to do is you're trying to shift someone from one cycle of depression, where they're feeling low, they're getting less out of life, and your only target is what they are physically doing and changing only that. And that will make them feel better and they'll get them more in their life. It's very limited in what you're addressing. So I thought it was kind of worth pointing out, you know, when looking at cognitive behavior therapy, there are contrary findings to well, why does cognitive therapy work the way it does? You know, some, some researchers have found out that when they've, when they've done their own studies of, of isolating the different aspects of cognitive behavior therapy, it actually, in some studies, shows that the, the actual uh, cognitive interventions are not related to outcomes at all. 
And what really is that related to the outcomes are the, the skills of the agenda setting. The first 10 minutes of therapy when you're setting the agenda might actually have the larger effect in therapy than everything else you do in the next hour. Wait, but how, how could you study such a thing in a research project? In other words, we're only giving them the first 10 minutes. Yeah, they do. They, uh, we killed the last 50. They do deconstruction studies, yeah, where they're only doing agenda setting. And they would have some sort of um, uh, um, way of, of, of limiting therapy to only that. Yep, yep. Um, we also see in general that, well, you know, in non-cognitive therapies, people's cognitions change. So it actually becomes, well, a question of, well, is, is the cognitive change that's achieved, well, is that a consequence of the therapeutic improvement, or was that what caused the improvement? That's not obvious. It might just be an outcome. As, as, we, as, we, as we're going to see with, with, uh, with, with this particular research, the cognitive changes of the people that had only behavioral activation were quite large. And they weren't addressing thoughts one bit. So it could very well be that that cognitive change is really a result and not a mechanism of change. Could be. It could also be that, well, all these different uh, aspects of a person, their thoughts, emotions, and behaviors might actually just line up like almost like parallel lines in their life. And so it might not matter where you start, you could start behaviorally and that will bleed into the way they think and feel. You could start emotionally and that'll bleed into the way they behave and think. That might also be. So it's just worth kind of putting on the table. It's not exactly clear that that kind of behavior therapy, what makes it work is the cognitive aspect of things. It's not clear, but could be also. I, mean, like I, I don't want to misrepresent. There's also loads of research that does support that hypothesis. But it's only a hypothesis. So as far as as far as our 2006 paper is concerned, what do we got? So we had 241 participants. They were between 18 and 60 years old. All of them met criteria for major depression, which they were either scoring 20 or higher on Beck's assessment, or they were getting a 14 or higher on the Hamilton scale. And we were excluding everybody who had a personality disorder. So we were only dealing with people with major depression. Everybody was assigned to one of four groups. You were either getting behavioral activation, cognitive therapy, and the third group was broken into two subgroups. You were getting medication, or you were getting a placebo. How can you get placebo therapy? Like you would just you're getting. Medication. You go into it. You go into a psychiatrist, and you're being you given. You're getting, you, you, there was no therapy. No, no therapy. It's okay. just meds. Just meds. And what they did was they didn't want to just see what worked best, but they all were also curious, well, maybe these therapies will act and behave differently with different levels of depression. So they, they stratified uh, you know, more severe depression and less severe depression to see how do these three uh, you know, measure up. And like I said, all these, all these therapists were well-trained. They were receiving supervision from the best in the field uh, for their particular therapeutic tradition. And this is a breakup of how everybody was put into their various groups. Um, unfortunately, there was one suicide in this, in this particular experiment, and it was in the medication group that we had the suicide. 30 did not complete in the antidepressant group? Yeah. That's pretty high. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is, yeah. You see a lot of, with especially medication, high rates of non-completion. The non-completion rates between behavioral activation, cognitive therapy, and narcissism is significant, and they're low. Lower, lower scores. Again, you also have yep. medication with no therapy. Yep, medication, no, no, no therapy. therapy. Just meds. Just meds. That's what I was Just meds. And one was placebo and one was not. And one was not, okay. So we've kind of already gone through this. But the placebo effect. Yeah. You we, we don't have their outcomes yet. No, these are just the these are just how people have broken up. Do not complete was not assigned maybe because they did not experience. Yeah, they, yeah, they, exactly. They weren't experiencing side effects. That's why they were. That's why they were completing it. One hundred percent. Okay. So the and it, again, like that, and it's just worth seeing. Like if you're making a clinical judgment, like maybe it's not a good idea to put someone on meds. Like that might not be a good idea. You got to watch out because they might come off meds and you just earned yourself a whole month of mess with how their biology is now fluctuating dramatically. Or they could be suicidal from the meds themselves. Which yep, happen. that sometimes happens. That sometimes happens. That sometimes happens. So I okay, we basically sometimes already went. And sometimes it can save their life. Yep. So we already... We, 
I don't know. It, 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 I mean that. I mean that issue is something to think about. You know, Marshall Linehan. Sacred life, not necessarily, no, but no. just and, like uh, their life becomes brighter, right. brighter. Right. Brighter. That whatever was. Bothered. And that could be the right. And that that's and placebo is powerful. Like I don't want to poo poo yeah. it. Um, but like I mean, we do as clinicians, we're not just making decisions based on what's clinically good, but we're also making decisions based on what doesn't get us fined or thrown in jail. Like that also is true. So Marsha Linehan, in her in her research with borderline personality disorder, she she puts down on the table point blank: there's zero research showing if you put that person in inpatient treatment that it helps them. Right. And in fact, there's mountains of, of research showing it hurts them and makes them way yeah. worse and you're more likely to have them commit suicide when they're released from hospital. But we do it so we don't get sued or have malpractice. What about psychiatric boarding school? I'm, o I'm only talking about borderline personality, self-harm bor borderline personality. I'm talking about borderline personality. I just wanted to know if there was, so, if there was any research on, on psychiatric boarding schools. Or, I, I mean, no idea. Me I don't know. I mean, a lot. Of, I mean, with their boarding schools, they're more like live in long term. Yeah. They could actually be very helpful. I'm just talking about brief hospitalization, oh, so the person doesn't right. So the person doesn't kill themselves, in theory. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay. And and as far as what was being added was was the the exploration of alternative behaviors, uh, role playing and validation were were the three new ingredients in the behavioral aspect that didn't exist in the first in the first research. And again, just again, uh, the, the, the main emphasis here of, of CBT is we're, we're again, we're, we're targeting cognitive beliefs, we're trying to, to uh, figure out which ones are, are, are generating erroneous interpretations of events, and that's, that's what we're shooting for here. And we're hitting first uh, automatic thoughts and developing treatment into trying to look at s uh, schemas or beliefs later on in treatment. So, what do we got for the, the pharmos? That's right. The medication they were using was paroxetine. Uh, they were on a flexible schedule. And they were getting. They were trying to work. Is it's an antidepressant. So the psychiatrist was encouraged to be a nice psychiatrist when he was meeting with with the clients. Um, and, 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 and it's no joke. You know, um, Wampold's Wampold's lab did a really cool study where what they what they uh, set up was what they set up was having the good psychiatrist giving the placebo and the and he was putting in a lot of care and describing everything you know good bedside banner and the bad psychiatrist who just gave the guy the actual medication mm -hmm. and it turned out that the good psychiatrist who was giving the placebo had better outcomes than the bad psychiatrist giving the real medication placebo effect right so the medication what is really make what really makes the medication effective yeah yeah. That is always the That is the question. Well, what's really triggering depression? That, you know, some of this thing, massive, critical, judgmental, could be a very big trigger if you have a normal psychiatrist. I mean, that could be that quick. Yeah. Because, because you go yeah. for help and you're depressed yeah. and someone's keeping yeah. you in Yeah, I mean, that's, that's yeah, 100%. 100%. It's worth noting, you know, that as far as when we start looking at the outcomes, that a large part of this is going to be not just the actual medication. As far as the measures concerned, everyone was sorted out using the skids to make sure we were only treating people with major depression. We were using two, uh, two measures for depression, BEX. Uh, Beck's scale for depression in the Hamilton. And what's, re what's really cool to keep in mind as we go through this is the way that Beck conceptualizes depression is a lot more cognitive. So if you're using that assessment, uh, a lot of the questions have more of a cognitive bent to it than the Hamilton. And we're going to see if there are dramatic differences in how the outcomes are measured in these three groups. What's SCID 1 and SCID 2? Skids. That's, yeah, that's structured clinical interview for the DSM. Uh, yeah, of course. And everybody is being monitored. Everybody is is being uh, monitored by by um, uh, master therapist to make sure they're actually doing CBT. No one's slipping in anything. Everyone's actually doing behavioral activation. And that was also measured using using uh, cognitive therapy scale that Young developed. Um, and unfortunately, there was no actual. Um, sort of uh, scale to use to make sure people are using behavioral activation because this was before it was invented. This was like this is the birth of behavioral activation. So they were kind of doing a best guess on that one. So these are the outcomes. What do we got? So when it came to the, so when it, so we saw, so we saw that the 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 pharma solution we had high rates of attrition. People are dropping out like flies. It was forty four percent. 
Whereas when it came to cognitive therapy and behavioral activation, it was over 13%, 16%. And like I said, they're not statistically different. You know, that's, that's very, pretty low in terms, of dropout. in terms of dropout, right. Um, when looking at the, the, the high severity depression group, behavioral activation was way more, way more effective than cognitive therapy. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was way better than the medical uh, medical option with with uh, with the psychiatrists, mm -hmm. and what was also really cool to see was how that behavioral activation the the response rate was 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 significant as well as actually you know actually seeing that the, that that uh, that they um, 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 not only were people becoming clinically not depressed but even those that weren't we were seeing that something was happening with behavioral activation. You were seeing movement with it. Whereas with the cognitive therapy and the medication, you weren't seeing much response in those two. As far as the less severely depressed group, um, things are pretty similar, actually. The, the results are basically dead even. Medication, cognitive therapy, and behavioral activation more or less are doing the same thing. Um, but the more severe the, the worked way better. So we, we the, go to the next the next uh, slide. We'll see as, as far as the graphs are concerned. The the one on top is is Beck's assessment, and you see the solid line is behavioral activation. And over 16 weeks, this is what that treatment looked like. Whereas with cognitive therapy, it's running in third, and behavioral activation is just outdoing the medication. Uh, with the Hamilton, the, 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 the scores are, are more tight, but it's the same pattern. And again, the reason why they're more tight is because this scale is not actually factoring in depressed cognitions. Yeah. Yeah. And the low severity group on the right, you see it's basically the same scores, but still we have behavioral activation out, outperforming you cognitive have therapy. activation and medication, will you have a better outcome? Maybe. Maybe, maybe. Uh, it, the Barlow has done a lot of work on that. You, what, what ends up happening is like you have a short-term boost, yeah. but by the end of treatment, there's no difference. So it's like it might like the heartache of going through the medication ultimately doesn't pay off at the end of treatment. The brain to stick more. You, you might it, it, <laughs> it, 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 long term long term research shows you don't even get that. You, what you get is a quick boost. So like if you need to like get see some action quick in therapy, yeah, it's a great strategy. But seeing long-term outcomes using medication plus therapy, eh? But you see on the top yeah. graph, the medication it looks like if they were continued, it actually succeed more than the solid Good question. A little bit. See that, that yeah, yeah, a little bit. Right, that's why I was wondering. Little if you could bit. Together, little bit. Together, little bit. Yeah. Like little the bit. Medication yeah. And that and that's that's also not even uh, statistically significant. So it could have easily been the reverse. So like it's really not. I, yeah, you're right, but. Yeah. 16 months or 16 weeks. 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 16 weeks. So meaning if you were to take it over 10 years, mm -hmm. maybe it would be sick. Oh, you don't want to... No, no. I mean, you're, end, you're ending up... Yeah, it's... Yeah, you know. No, no, no. You get way more problems over long-term medical use by a lot. Yeah. So... Now this thing has been around since 2006, right? Have yep. you tried it for schizophrenia? Have they tried it for um, borderline? Like, where, where has it been tried, or is it still sticking around depression and anxiety? Um, a lot of a lot of DBT is based on behavioral activation. A lot of a lot of the same skills are going to be lining up. Okay. High validation, opposite action. Sounds you're you're trying to stay away from avoidance. Um, and as far I don't, I haven't seen anything with behavioral activation alone being used for schizophrenia, but Not ACT, alone. but ACT sure is, and ACT is, is basically a souped up behavioral activation. Yeah. You're just adding in values and a lot of metaphors. Yeah. So, and that is very successful with schizophrenia. Yeah. So here we have, so the, the, we're breaking up here, what we're looking at is in the black is where you're having full remission, you're seeing full recovery. And the, the, light, the light gray is, yes, you're seeing a response. So when you're looking at Beck's, uh, the Beck's assessment, you have, a, you have a high response rate with behavioral activation, uh, whereas that, that's kind of shrunk with, with the Hamilton. So I thought that was, that was actually very interesting to see that, that slight difference. Um, but here again, this is, this is what we're looking at in terms of the outcomes.
Well, okay, can you go back to that other one and explain it a little more? Yeah. I don't get what the gray is. And yeah. So the, the gray, the gray is is that you're seeing improvement, but the person still is clinically depressed. Okay. But that that's how many people are seeing improvement. So I mean, it's not so much. I mean, like here is like a seven seven uh, percent difference and you know eight percent difference. You know, it's not so large. But when it came to behavioral activation, it was quite large. So ideally, if these people would continue with behavioral activation thing past the sixteen weeks, yeah. they would be doing hell of a lot. Yeah, they would. They would. They would be fully recovering. Yep. But according to how Beck defines depression, because you don't have that with the Hamilton, which is on the right. It's the same group of people. But how you define depression is super important. Yeah. Uh, the def definitions are everything. Right. Right. How you define success. Right. Does it include? Cognitive aspects or not, 100%. Okay, so a couple discussion points here. I mean, like what, what's coming out here is that this study was a major challenge to treatment guidelines. That we're seeing that behavioral activation is way more effective at treating severe depression than medication. So that has been a shift with, with treatment recommendations. That behavioral activation is, is considered the gold standard for depression. Um, what's What's kind of interesting about this also is a little question of this, this idea of well, what, what keeps people from becoming depressed. And a lot of times when we look at this sort of research, we're thinking, you know, well, we're looking at populations which for whatever reason they, they, they got depression, but most people don't. Like very, very few people end up. You know, when something bad happens, I'm actually developing depression. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is high. You know, if you're looking at it's in what it's it's one of it. It is high. You know, it's you, depending on some high. depending on some research, it's 15 to 20 percent of the population in their, in their lifetime. But at the same time, well, like and then the who don't loads of bad things happen to people. Like even those people who end up de developing you know, depression. Just be drinking. It, you can't really. That doesn't really mean anything. Because people mm -hmm. do all sorts of things that to handle what they don't want to handle. Yeah, and and they may be a lot of avoidance, which isn't really. Clinical. It's worth it's worth looking depression. at the research of Meichenbach on this one. That what he's right. what he's coming out to what his work is really trying to show why it is that so many people don't end up suffering psychological problems when really bad things happen. It's not so simple, it's an automatic. Really although it's true, really although it's true, yes, it is very high, but again, it's, it's not always yeah. when bad things happen oh, that depression I have a question, it's not, it's not interesting, sorry. It's yeah. a case kind of thing of like somebody who, <clears throat> I mean, I've seen this kind of thing before, when someone's quite, maybe there's a depression somewhere, but they're keeping themselves moving from one thing to another thing almost mm -hmm. compulsively to yeah. stop but it. like but they they keep themselves motivated because they don't want to go down. Yeah. Is that health or is it unhealthy? Like in this I don't know, right? I mean, if you're a cognivist, um, like that would depend. Like you know, if I if your focus is on what they think, and I mean, and there's then it could be, or it could. But 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 they also keeping things yeah. moving so that they don't get. I don't know. I'm your treatment sure. theory matters. It could be yes or no. It, and this is this is it's a cool question. Like you know, we kind of touched on it a little bit. Is when someone comes in the room, you know, well, one reason why to have a pretty broad scope of, of approaches is because not everything works for everybody. Right. But at the same time, like you are confronted with this individual I'm looking at right now. I could either be a cognitivist, I could be a behavioralist, I could go with ACT, I could do a lot of stuff, and it really matters. It really matters. It's not obvious, you know, if I were to take a behavioral perspective on that client you're talking about, that, well, those aren't problems, and I would treat them like they're not problems, and he would buy into the, buy into the, the philosophy of treatment, and, and he'll maybe, you know, likely, it's likely he also will consider them not a problem, and he'll leave therapy feeling great. Things worked out. But taking a cognitive approach... It might work, it might not. I mean, you get that both ways, but it's like you're really making a choice here. What sort of, what sort of, how, how you want to name the problem, not entirely, but in a pretty big extent, makes the problem. It's, it's yes, 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 it is. So as far as, as far as like, you know, Meichenbach's research, um, you know, illustrating how, 
you know, it, it seems to be one of the main reasons why most people don't get depression is because they're living a behavioralist life. They have friends, they have family, they 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 have they they have fun, you know, like they're they're doing things, right? And that can be very constructive. Yeah. Like say there's like being like a terrible history. Yep. An abusive history, whatever, back in the background. Mm -hmm. right, it can I only mention it because it really it really does go the grain goes against the grain of therapeutic thinking that most people who go through horrible things in no, life that's actually the research doesn't show that not people yes it, do, it's, it's things do not, do not necessarily there was a whole scandal out. with the APA on this way there was a whole scandal with the APA on this issue that while it is it's it's not what you'd think. Most it's something like seventy percent of people. Like it's very it's it's a small proportion of people, but it's 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 worth at least like thinking about is like as a. Well, that's what Dr. Yeah. Lilaha did. He went all over the world. Yeah. And he found this thing, basic pH, that these are the basic six coping mechanisms mm -hmm. that everybody in the world manages to get through the worst things yeah. in humankind. And he teaches them as pre prevention, actually. But and they're, they're going around yeah. the kindergartens and they're teaching coping skills to three year olds yeah. because they in yeah. this country because yeah. it really works. Because they go through the earthquakes. Second. They go through terrorism. They go through. Yeah. They go through the worst abuse that ever was, yeah. and they're okay because they, they have their coping. But, but they've also found. But they've I'll be also happy to found teach that they've, also, they've also found that great. They've also found that these major events, people actually are, have more coping skills. It's the things that happen on the day to day that break people down more. That if you yes. look at yes. everything, you can right. these no. people are basically okay. But, they, if they're able to hold on to the basic pH, but if then you, if you look at if you look at big events that we think will knock people out, they're not usually. It's usually the things that are consistently mm. happening on a day to day basis that are where people, where people down, are rather than that a bit that big yeah. event. Right. That big event we are actually programmed often to deal with well. But it's those the other the cons consistency is what wears I saw, us down. I saw, I saw, I saw one paper are, where and often because you have a community of people there mm -hmm. helping you get through this. I saw one paper with this you know after really after smart. after you know real you know life threatening uh, tragedies you know they go in they do debriefing you know it's oftentimes recommended a lot of research shows that actually makes it worse right. in the debriefing. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like you know, pi man, pick your poison. Like that's basically right. like the thought I guess I'm sharing is mm -hmm. that. You know, maybe kind of thank God that people usually do pretty well. I guess that's more of like, you know, kind of yeah. putting that one out there. And that it might not be that the complex sort of going deep and, you know, the cognitive distortions, it might actually be more likely, if you're a betting man, to just kind of be a normal dude helping people do a, do a normal life. Like that, and I mean do, you know, like that might actually be it. Not always. And definitely, there are a lot of problems that are definitely not that way when you get into personality disorders. But DBT definitely challenges that notion 110%. And maybe you don't have to go so deep. Maybe it's enough to throw a bunch of skills at people and they end up not wanting to kill themselves and get a job. And then they, fend, they end up feeling pretty good. You know, so it's, that's, it's something to think about. It's something you to think know, about. I, I think what we yeah. were just talking about, just at, 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 you know, you always think of the Gottman thing, you know, when you yeah. talk about couples and yeah. the, the ratio of, of uh, good interactions, it's five to one, and I yeah. think that, that yeah. like, life is like that, too. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. Having, you know, yes. many more negative interactions with life, they tend to, they tend to you know, they yeah. tend to, to, to not be resilient, <clears throat> resilience approach. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Which I think is what we do with therapy, actually, is, is yeah. hopefully we can provide a secure base for people that come in that are broken yeah. and rebuild that, that secure base, you know, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. It also it also even even when you are going to get cognitive, um, you know, the research coming out of this sort of branch is is wondering, well maybe Albert Ellis kinda had it right in his version of cognitive restructuring. You know, Beck, like I said, he's a poet. When you see that man in action, it's beautiful to watch him. Has anyone seen Albert Ellis work? The man's a jerk. He is He's mean. He's obnoxious. He's obnoxious. I remember He's now. like, why He's are you th horrible. horrid? Very in your face, yes. And that is the type of cog the cognitive, uh, the cognitive uh, uh, work that's done in DBT is only Albert Ellis's approach, not Beck. You tell him to do it. And, you, and even, even with the, with the, in DBT, the different, different um, sort of irreverent 
responses you give a client is like you, you kind of actually give it and put it in their face a little bit. You are a little irreverent. You are kind of like, hey man, just think different. And that might be that might be a strategy worth exploring, you know, especially something as severe as borderline personality disorder. So that's 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 I guess you know the long, the long and short of uh, behavioral activation. And I, I said like if you guys are, are interested, I, I I think it'd be really awesome. Uh, it's an awesome uh, book to get the the one that I cited here, the 2010 book. Um, I have it. I can loan it out. But uh, it's cool. It's a cool it's a cool approach to take. One thing I was like kind of thinking about, you know, trying to figure out, well, you know, why, why is it that this is more effective with depression? And I, I don't know, there's a lot of research, it's kind of funny, you know, how it's not a lot, but it's a fair amount that, you know, the more that, a, the, the, the older the therapist, the less effective he becomes. It's very interesting. The more you work as a therapist, the less effective you become. It, and so, it might, so like you know, one thought of it, one, one possible explanation is, well, it might be that, well, you know, you're being responsible, you're trying to do the right thing, you're, you're learning a lot of different interventions, things get very complex. And it might be that one reason that, that, that manifests is that maybe the therapist's making things a little too complicated and they're, right. they're tripping over their own tennis Sometimes shoelaces. And something as simple as, you know, maybe, well, maybe one big factor here with behavioral activation is the fact that it's, it's extremely simple. It's nice. Not so many moving parts. That might be another, another aspect of this. Yeah. Do easy therapy. See what happens first. You know, someone comes in, make sure they're eating breakfast and they're sleeping eight hours. Then see what happens. You know, it might be the end of treatment. I've had clients that way. Good. You're eating, you're eating, eating hours and sleeping. All of a sudden, your anxiety and depression scores are basically nothing. Have a nice day. That could be. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Thank you. Practical and hopefully educational, but very simple. Very good. Very good. Yes. Very good. Yes. 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 Yes.